once was traveling across the sky. This lovely play caught my eye. Being curious, I flew close by. Now I'm caught here till I die.
to sleep for the moment dreams are sacred I close my eyes and know there's peace in a world so filled with hatred and I wake up each morning and turn on the news to find we've so far to go and I keep on hoping for a sign so afraid I just want
שלום שלום, פיס 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 שלום שלום. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to virtual worship with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Silver Spring. I'm Bonnie Gallion, today's worship associate, and my pronouns are she and her. Our summer worship series, UU at the Movies, continues. Some of our summer services have been offered to UUCSS as part of a collaboration among our minister, Reverend Kristen Grassel Schmidt, and many other ministers around the country. Other services will be created and led by members of this congregation. You won't want to miss any of them. This morning, we explore themes of the holidays, culture, communication, self-exploration, and striving for more in the classic Tim Burton family favorite, The Nightmare Before Christmas. This service is shared with us by the worship team at the Fox Valley UU Fellowship in Appleton, Wisconsin. You may notice that this service unfolds in a different order than UUCSS services usually do. And the chalice will be lit this morning by a special guest. Whether this is your first time joining us for virtual worship or you're a long timer, I'm so glad you're here. Mary Beth Lerner is our welcoming captain and would be glad to answer your questions in the chat. Mary Beth will also be available during virtual coffee hour after the service. If you are watching live, you can log into Google to participate in the chat in real time. This is a big part of how we connect with one another during these services. Comments won't be available for later playback, but during the service, they are very public, so please keep that in mind. Also, the live chat has some safety features to prevent disruptive comments, so you won't be able to post special characters or complete web addresses. You can log into a special Zoom room if you'd like to watch the service accompanied by American Sign Language. If you need help finding the link to that room, please ask in the chat or email VS Tech Support at UUCSS.org. In a few moments, everyone will be invited to light our flaming chalices. So now's a good time to go and get a chalice, a candle, or even a flashlight so you can join us in kindling the flame of community. But first, let's take a moment to say thank you to all those who made today's service possible. Yeah. 
what's this? What's this? There's something in the air. It's time to fill our chalice flame, but why? Not to fill the jack-o'-lanterns, but to fill our hearts with warmth and glow as we settle into worship together. Join me, boos and ghouls and spookies of every gender and age, as we say the words that the Fox Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship says each week. We light this flame as a symbol of new life, enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let the lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. As we gather here for worship, we pledge ourselves to the endless search for truth, to the right of each to believe as mind, heart, and conscience dictates, to accept the responsibilities this freedom commands, and to implement our belief in the essential worth and dignity of every human being. The Nightmare Before Christmas is a Tim Burton classic, a 1993 stop motion animated film with two main characters, Jack, the Pumpkin King, who is not a pumpkin, but actually a very skinny singing skeleton, and Sally, the Frankenstein's monster-esque creation of a mad scientist. The movie takes place mostly in Halloween Town, which is nestled inside a tree in a forest. Halloween Town and all of its residents, each of them spooky in their own way, are responsible for making Halloween happen for the world each year, and they are good at it. Jack, though. Jack is the best of the best. He is the scariest and spookiest of them all, and Halloween Town loves him. They worship him. But rather than enjoy the adulation, Jack is sick of it. He is bored of scaring people. He's tired of all the darkness and gross and ghoulish things. He longs for more. And so on a long and mopey walk, he discovers that his tree, or town, it's complicated, is not the only tree in the forest. There are others, each of them, containing a town dedicated to a different holiday. So Jack finds himself in Christmas town. He is so excited to find something different, something cheerful and joyful and kind and fun, so different from the world he knows. And he is craving something different. So he decides he's going to take it, try it on himself and try to do Christmas this year. He hatches a plan that involves kidnapping Santa himself and enlisting the residents of Halloween Town in his scheme to create and deliver gifts around the world in the true Christmas spirit. But of course, it goes terribly wrong. Jack and his Halloween neighbors simply don't get it. 
they can't shake off their spookiness. They try to do Christmas. Jack tries to understand it, but his perspective is too limited to really understand. So after a Christmas filled with mayhem, Jack realizes his mistakes with a lot of help from Sally. And they return Santa to his role just in time for him to work his Christmas magic. And Jack agrees to stick with what he does best. And he finally realizes how great Sally is. And they fall in love. The end. The end. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for helping me with the Time for All Ages today. Hi, Christina. Sure. Happy to help. Before we get started, how are you doing? Oh, thanks for asking. I'm I'm okay. I'm, you know, bored, ready for things to fully reopen so I can go do some stuff. Yeah, I understand that. I'm also bored. I'm stuck here at home after my Achilles surgery. I can't do anything. I can barely even get around my house, let alone go do anything fun out in the world. Ah, that sounds really rough, Cindy. How are you managing? Well, I'm trying to keep myself busy, but it's hard. I feel like I've done every possible puzzle and coloring book out there, but I did get a new one recently and it's pretty challenging, which I like. Hang on, let me grab it and I'll show it to you. Cool, I want to see it. Oh, okay. Hey, wait, Cindy, are you, are you in a wheelchair right now? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. I would love to have a wheelchair. Then I could do fun stuff in it, like wheel around and race on the sidewalk and stuff. Uh, Christina, it's a wheelchair. It's not a toy. I mean, I know. I know it's not a toy, but I'm just so bored these days. Something new and different like a wheelchair would be really cool to play with. Hey, can I borrow your wheelchair for a few days? What? No, are you kidding? I need it because of my ankle and my surgery recovery. Okay, I mean, don't get all offended, Cindy. I'm just asking to use it. I won't break it or anything. I just want to play with it for a few days. It would really break up the boredom of these long days. I hear you, Christina. I know you're bored, but you can't just take my wheelchair. It's not yours, and it isn't for that. It's Something I need. It's important to my mobility right now. You can't just use it for whatever you want. That's that's not how it works. <sighs> oh, okay. I guess that makes sense. I just I just got all excited. I was only thinking about what I wanted and needed. I wasn't really thinking about your needs and how your wheelchair is meant to be used. I'm sorry. Oh. You know, I was worried about you, though, for a minute there, Christina. I hope you can find something else to keep you from being bored. Maybe try a new coloring book. Good idea. So any of you at home, have you ever felt like you need something more or different in your life? That happens a lot. It happens with toys or activities or even sometimes more precious things like religious practices or cultural identity. People sometimes wish that they just had something more, but it's important that we not just take stuff from other people. We can't take things that aren't ours, not toys or belongings and not religious or cultural practices either. As much as we want something more or different, we need to be careful to find our own ways or be very careful about being in relationship with people who invite us into practice, into their practice, rather than just taking things for our own purposes. When people take the practices of other religions or cultures without understanding or sensitivity, we call it cultural appropriation. Today, we're talking about this idea through the lens of a silly movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas about a Halloween skeleton who is sick of Halloween and wants to try Christmas. But it doesn't go well because he's taking something that isn't his to take. And he hasn't done the work to really understand and do it well. So 
let's all try to remember how important it is to be loving, careful, and sensitive when we explore things that are new to us and might belong to someone else. It is the practice of this congregation to hold sacred space for sharing joys and sorrows. This is an important part of our worship together, even though we haven't always done it the same way. Before the pandemic, when we only gathered in person, we often shared verbally from a microphone in the sanctuary. Other times, everyone could write their joys and sorrows down and a worship leader would share them during the service. During the pandemic, we invite anyone with a joy or sorrow to share, to type it into the chat box while gentle music plays. As we prepare to transition to hybrid worship in the fall, where people will be able to participate both virtually and in person, we will likely try different ways of sharing our joys and sorrows until we find what works best for that setting. But no matter what form our joys and sorrows take, it's important to remember that everything we share will be public during the live broadcast. If you're experiencing something difficult in your life and would like some extra support, I encourage you to send an email to layministers at uucss.org and they will be in touch. Thankfully, no one needs special training or a special title to offer love and care to others. So please go ahead and grab a notepad or make a note in your favorite app for those whose joys and sorrows touched you and who you'd like to reach out to this week. If you're watching this service later as a recording, I hope you hold your own joys and sorrows as tenderly as you would those of others, and that you'll send loving kindness to all the people in our world and your life who need it. Let us now open our hearts to the joys and sorrows this gathered community has to share.
Sally is the character in the movie who cares most authentically for Jack. She tries to provide a caring presence for him, even though he struggles to receive it until the very end. Each of us needs someone like that in our lives to celebrate with us when we are joyful, to mourn with us when we grieve, and to simply be alongside us when we need companionship. Our faith communities each strive to provide such ministries of presence. We invite you to be in touch, to let us know how you're doing and how we might be able to be your companion on this journey of life. As we hold each of the joys, sorrows, concerns, and transitions in our heart, we invite you into a moment of silence to hold them all. Amen. When I joined this group of cooperative Unitarian Universalist clergy to share worship services this summer, it was my big idea to focus on movies. I thought, hey, it'll be fun. Maybe we can do movie nights or something. An easy way to tie in a bunch of services together. And it turns out it has been fun, but at first, I really, really struggled to decide what movie I wanted to focus on. I changed my mind several times, and finally one of my coworkers said, what's Nevin's favorite movie right now? She was referring to my five-year-old son, Nevin, and wondering if that might give me some inspiration. The problem is, Nevin doesn't really watch movies. For whatever reason, he likes TV, but he just doesn't have many movies that he likes. Except The Nightmare Before Christmas. Don't ask me why, but this kid who is actually quite sensitive and has a lot of reasonable fears for a five-year-old loves The Nightmare Before Christmas. In fact, this summer, for his annual big adoption day party, the theme for the party is Nightmare Before Christmas. I wasn't even familiar with this movie until I met my husband a decade ago, but I have come to learn what a following it has. It is among those favorite Christmas movies that many people list alongside Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Miracle on 34th Street, and Die Hard. But this one, The Nightmare Before Christmas, is 
weird. I mean, I guess Die Hard is a weird for a Christmas movie, but I'm not here to judge. The Nightmare Before Christmas is also a Halloween movie. And in some ways, it's neither. See, I have a lot of empathy for Jack Skellington, the Pumpkin King. He's good at his job, but he's bored. He's depressed. And I imagine living in Halloween Town would get depressing. It's always gloomy, spooky, creepy. There's no laughter except the prankster type. There's no jolliness, very little color or light. So I have empathy for the fact that when he finds Christmas Town, he is overwhelmed by the difference from his day-to-day -day life, and he is so excited by what he has discovered. Me, personally, I love the holidays. I love all of them. I love to deck out my house and decorations, put up lights and find festive shirts and earrings. For Christmas, yes, but also for Easter, Thanksgiving, and Halloween. My two biggest decorating holidays are definitely Halloween and Christmas. So I understand Jack's feelings here. I understand how he can love Halloween, but also long for something new. Have you ever felt that way? Kind of stuck in a rut, wishing for something more, something beyond your usual experience? Growing up, I was sort of strangely attracted to church and religion. My family weren't church-going people, and that was fine by my brother, but for whatever reason, I was the weird kid who wanted to go to church, who would do things like build churches in my closet and preach to my stuffed animals. I attended church with my friends and it felt good, but in elementary school, I remember inventing a whole new religion with my friend, Lindsay. We worshiped a goddess and we had all sorts of rules for what that worship entailed and forbade. I have no memory of how this came to be, but I remember that it didn't last long because my friend's family found out and their Christian faith clearly did not allow for the worship of random other gods. But I recall this memory from a place of empathy for what we are going to talk about today. The idea that sometimes our deep longings for something more can land in ways that are at best awkward and at worst harmful. How can we seek and find that more without causing harm? The scene that is my favorite in the whole of the movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, takes place early on Christmas night. After much preparation, Jack has finally taken off in his sleigh, despite the thick fog, utilizing his ghost dog, Zero, whose bright red nose reminds us of Rudolph. And they're flying from housetop to housetop as Jack delivers the gifts that the residents of Halloween Town have prepared for the good children of the world. Jack slides down each chimney and carefully places the gifts in the stockings and under the tree. And early in the evening, a little boy sneaks down, hearing Santa, and he sees Jack. Stunned, the little boy can't even talk. But Jack just smiles his giant, toothy, skeleton grin and says, Merry Christmas, and hands the boy a gift and then scampers back up the chimney. Jack is 
reveling in this joyful job. And that's one of the reasons I love this scene so much, his joy. But what Jack fails to realize is that the lights are switching on all over town. Screams are following in his wake. His intention to bring Christmas joy has failed. And his impact is that he is actually terrifying people with each delivery of Halloween Town scariness. It's a funny scene, but it's also sad. It's sad that Jack is, for the moment, so oblivious to the harm that he's causing, thinking only about the fun that he is having. Many people in majority culture, white, cisgender, heterosexual, Christian, are inundated or surrounded by our culture as normative. It's all around us all the time, so much so that we don't even have to think about it. It just is. And sometimes that can feel boring. Many of the ancestors of those of us who identify as white immigrated to this country or came as colonizers, and they shed many of the particularities of their heritage and culture, their German customs or their Norwegian language, in an attempt to assimilate into quote unquote mainstream culture. They did this as a way to survive and thrive in this country. And they or their children reaped the benefits of that white assimilation. But that means that many of us white folks don't know our heritage. We don't carry with us much that is particular or unique. On the other hand, marginalized communities like people of color, religious minorities, the GLBTQ community, disabled folks, and others have had to maintain their cultural and religious heritage or carve out cultural space as a form of survival in the face of repeated attempts at erasure or elimination by majority culture. Recently, in late May, the discovery of a mass grave at the Kamloops Residential School in Canada brought to light again the horrific heritage of Indian residential schools. The fact that children, children were forcibly removed from families, abused, stripped of their language, their hair, their culture. This news reminds us all that indigenous North Americans and indigenous people around the world have had to fight heroically to maintain their identity and culture and their very lives. Something that many of us in majority culture don't ever have to even think about. I could name countless examples of the powerful and rich cultural and religious markers that marginalized communities have maintained or claimed in order to exist. Here are just a few. The Passover Seder for Jewish families and communities. Pride parades and celebrations for GLBTQ folks. El Dia de los Muertos or La Quinceañera for Mexican and Latino communities. Black power or Pan-African pride, Afros, locks, hip-hop music, Kwanzaa. These are only a tiny fraction of the examples of the ways that communities that experience harm and erasure have staked out their existence with pride and joy. But for those of us in majority culture, people like me, we fail to recognize the ways that we are constantly steeped in our own culture. It's not that we don't have one. 
We're just constantly steeped in it. Our holidays are celebrated publicly. Schools, banks, governments shut down in honor of the same holidays that I do. My relationship status, my marriage, my ability to parent are not questioned by authorities because of my gender or sexuality. The color of my skin, my ethnic heritage do not mark me for increased scrutiny, scrutiny by police or immigration officials. My name, my language, my accent do not prevent me from a fair shot at employment or housing. And so, when we feel bored, it is imperative that we find ways to create meaningful connections, rituals, and symbolism that are true to our own identities. Or if we are interested in forging true connections with cultural or religious experiences outside our own, that we do so very carefully and with a long path toward relationship first. Boredom or desire is not a good reason to borrow or take from other cultures. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a long history of participating in or encouraging cultural appropriation. Like Jack, we simply wanted to explore something new. An early Universalist ancestor, Kenneth Patton, who wrote many of the readings in our hymnal and many that were in previous hymnals, famously converted the Charles Street Meeting House in Boston, a stodgy old church with pews, to a sanctuary in the round. He had a nebula, the nebula Andromeda painted behind the pulpit, and he created a workshop in the basement to collect or forge bronze symbols of the faiths of the world. His attempt was part of the early universalist movement away from Christianity alone to a more universal faith, one that could encompass them all. But in hindsight, that's a grandiose goal, and it lacks humility. Do we really think that we will be the ones to encompass everything? And this form of Unitarian Universalism has continued well into the 21st century, an a la carte approach to religion and spirituality. I have to often remind folks when I teach about our six sources of inspiration that despite the way they are listed, they are not a menu from which we can pick and choose. If we are going to have a Seder, or celebrate El Dia de los Muertos, or Kwanzaa, we need to do that carefully and with deep connection to people in our communities whose identities are connected to those practices. Otherwise, we risk spiritual or cultural tourism, or worse, voyeurism. Now back to our movie. Jack Skellington's intentions were good in trying to pull off Christmas himself. I believe the intentions of many people who culturally appropriate are also good. The intention is to learn, to put ourselves in the shoes of someone different from ourselves, to expand our understanding or to honor and celebrate the culture that is not our own. I know that these are the intentions because I have done it more often than I would like to admit. I'm not pretending that I am the one white person who has never participated in cultural appropriation. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh gosh, I've done that, don't beat yourself up. So have I. But back to Jack, despite his good intentions, his impact was harmful. He tried, he really did try to understand Christmas. 
One of my other favorite scenes is during the song Jack's Obsession, where he tries to use the scientific method to figure out what this whole Christmas thing is about. But his limited perspective makes it impossible for him or for the residents of Halloween Town to really get it. There's just no way. He cannot take himself and his lifetime of Halloween out of the equation. His experience as a skeleton whose lifelong purpose has been to scare people makes his attempt at jolly joy simply not right. And when he forges ahead with his dangerously limited understanding, he harms the very people he was trying to help. This is classic cultural appropriation, well-intentioned, but with a limited perspective. As a straight person, I can have empathy for queer folks and joyfully celebrate for them at Pride, but what I don't get to do is host my own Pride party or dictate what Pride should look and feel like. As a white American, I can appreciate Black culture and the myriad gifts in our culture that Black Americans have made, but they aren't mine to try on as if they were my own. It would be insensitive of me to wear a kente cloth stole or put my hair in locks. If I'm invited to participate in my friend's family seder, I would warmly accept and do a little advanced reading so that I knew how to join in respectfully. But I won't be hosting a seder at my own house. It's not mine. When people from marginalized communities call out cultural misappropriation, they are often met with defensiveness. That defensiveness comes from the fact that, as we said earlier, the intentions are often good. People are trying to learn, grow, or connect, but like Jack, those intentions aren't translating into positive outcomes for those who are being impacted. The impact of appropriation on marginalized communities is that they feel, yet again, minimized, marginalized, erased, or harmed by the inevitably clumsy way, the inevitably clumsy use of their community's culture or religion. When I say inevitably clumsy, I mean it. It's inevitable. When people appropriate, we always miss something. We miss the nuance or the subtlety or the background. Perhaps not even for lack of trying, but simply because our perspective is just that. It's our perspective. It's not the same as the perspective of someone who comes from that culture. Just like Jack doesn't really understand Christmas, I will never really understand Juneteenth, even as I will expose my biracial Black children to our community celebration of the Freedom Day so that they might come to know it as their own. But it's not mine. I have not lived my life as a Black American, and I don't know the harm of that experience, so I don't get to borrow the joy of it. I'm going to say that again. I don't know, not really in my bones. I don't know the harm of that experience. So I don't get to borrow the joy of it. The key to avoiding appropriation lies in relationships. Perhaps if Jack had taken time to get to know Santa Claus, they would have come to understand each other and each other's holidays more fully. Perhaps then Santa might have invited Jack into a participatory role in Christmas. And wouldn't that have been fun for him? But instead, Jack literally had Santa kidnapped so he could take Christmas for himself. And we do well 
to remember that we will always find deeper connection, deeper learning and growth, joy, and a way out of our boredom when we forge authentic relationships. Amen. And may it be so. As we take time for our morning offering, we remember that the intention behind generosity can have an impact greater than we might ever know. Our Unitarian Universalist congregations exist to support each other and to support our wider communities. If you are in need of financial support, please reach out. We're here to help. If you're able to give, we ask that you do in a spirit of joy and abundance. There are three ways you can make your financial gift to the congregation. The first is by downloading the Give Plus mobile app from Vanco to set up an account. The second way is to give is by using your phone to text a message to 833-880-1363. And if the app or texting just don't work for you, the third way to give is by mailing a check directly to the church. All of the information you need for all three of these methods is on your screen now and will appear again toward the end of today's service. I hope you will join me in making an offering with gratitude for all of life's gifts and all that UUCSS means to you. May the gifts we have given fuel the flame of our commitment, empower us to serve out our mission, and Give the life we share the shape of truth, love, and justice. citizens of Halloween Town, thank you for coming to our service today. As we extinguish the flame in our chalice, we remember the one that continues to burn in the spirit of Halloween, the spirit of Christmas, and the spirit of joy all year long. We seek to keep the light of understanding and love kindled through the power of relationship. Oh. 
I'm gonna live. So I'm gonna live. So love can you so see love can use me anywhere, anywhere, anytime, anytime. I'm gonna live. So I'm gonna live. live. So love can you so love can use me anywhere. Sing, so I'm gonna sing, sing so love can you so love can use me anywhere, anywhere, anytime, and anytime. I'm gonna sing, so I'm gonna sing, sing so love can you so love can use me anywhere, anytime. I'm gonna walk. So I'm gonna walk, walk so love can you so love can use me anywhere, anywhere anytime and anytime I'm gonna walk so I'm gonna walk so love can you so love can use me anywhere anytime I'm gonna pray so Pray so love can you so see anywhere, anywhere, anytime, and anytime. I'm gonna pray so I'm gonna pray so love can you so love can me anywhere, anytime. I'm gonna live. So I'm gonna live.